Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to say technical difficulties, but that wouldn't be honest. <laughs> it's my own issues. Uh, man, a lot of proclaiming the greatness of God this morning. That's what we're here to do. Is he worthy? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Um, I'll just, I don't know, steal my own thunder. I was thinking when I was uh, preparing this message, uh, what, what, what did they preach in the Old Testament, <laughs> you know? I mean, if you were to have like a church service, what would you preach? And you could preach about some things that God had done as far as uh, military victories and saving his people from, uh, from different dangers. But you can preach the way us New Testament preachers can preach. <laughs> it's such a privilege um, to be able to preach about the good news of God sending his son and everything that he's accomplished in him. So I got to say, it's a, it's, a, it's a joy to preach. And especially uh, a passage like what we're looking at today. So in Hebrews chapter 10 is where we're going to be. And I'll... I'll uh, make my way there slowly, but surely, but surely, don't worry. Um, Aragon's been going through the book of Hebrews now for a little while, a couple months, and um, if you're familiar at all with the Bible, you know that the book of Hebrews, if you had to sum it up all in one word, would be, well, Jesus, of course, that's always the answer, but better. How is Jesus better? Better than all of these uh all of these references to the Old Testament. And so in, uh, in chapter 1, you have greater, the greater revelation of God. God has revealed himself in a lot of different ways, but now, in these last days, he's revealed himself in his Son, which is a greater revelation than any vision, than any, any dream, any kind of appearance that he had in the Old Testament. This is the greater and final revelation. Uh, and then next, you, you have Jesus is... And that's in chapter 1 and 2. And then Jesus is a greater steward than Moses, which Moses is who God had given the Ten Commandments to and all of the law. He's the one who wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. But Jesus is even greater in that Moses was faithful over a house as a steward, but Jesus was faithful over his house, meaning his people, as a son. And you see that the, the greatness of a son compared to a, a steward or a servant. Um, but then... You know, he, if you pay attention through the book of Hebrews, you see that it seems like he spends an extended amount of time talking about the priesthood of the Old Covenant. covenant. And so, in, uh, in, from chapter 4 all the way up until where we're at now, he kind of repeatedly alludes to or references the priesthood in order to make comparisons and contrasts. And so, for example, in chapter 4, verse 15, he says this about the priesthood. He said that the priesthood of Jesus is like the old covenant priesthood in this way. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. In the same way that the Levites, which were the chosen people of God among the chosen people of God. So within Israel, God's chosen people, he chose the Levites as his firstborn, and that they were going to be the ones that were responsible for the worship of him, for, for bringing the sacrifices, for moving the tabernacle whenever they would move from place to place. These were God's chosen people to, um, to offer these sacrifices. But they, they were Israelites nonetheless. They were of the people. And so Jesus, uh, in his priesthood, became similar to those he was representing or those he was operating on behalf of in the same way that the Levites were of the people of Israel. Does that make sense? So we see the author of Hebrews making a comparison there between the Levites being of the people. And so Jesus, this high priest that's even greater, is still of the people. He became flesh. <clears throat> then in chapter 5, verse 5, you have another comparison. It says that he was appointed by God in the same way, meaning the same way as what? The same way as those Levitical priests 
They were chosen by God, appointed by God. Aaron did not wish when he was 11 years old, when I grow up, I'm going to be a priest of the Most High God. That's not the way that that worked. God appointed him and said, you're going to be this priest. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a, a priest. But God said to him, and then it says, you are my son today, I have become your father. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So you see a comparison there between the priesthood. So not only is he of the people, just like the Levites are of the people, he's also appointed by God just as the Aaronic or Levitical, which is kind of a synonym in there, um, were chosen by God. Thirdly, a third comparison is that he has gone on our behalf into the very presence of God. The same way that Levitical priests used to go into the tabernacle as basically like a representative of the people. The Lord Jesus, as a priest, does the same thing. It says in chapter 6, verse 20, it, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Again, the reference to the inner sanctuary, the entrance to, uh, or the, the reference to him going in there is the same thing that the Levitical priests used to do. They used to go in there on behalf of the people. So this is another comparison of the Levitical priesthood to Jesus' priesthood. And I'm pointing this out just to show that, you know, when this was originally uh, written, the original audience would have just sat down and read the whole book. And so that's why I always think it's so important just to try to, and I've had to get better at this, but try to briefly bring us up to speed to where we're at. Uh, every time when I preach. And so, moving right along, we've seen comparisons between the priesthood of old and Jesus' priesthood. But there are also some contrasts. So a comparison is, this is the way it was, and Jesus is the same way but better. Now there's some contrast, which is to say that this is how the priesthood was. Jesus is not that. Or, or he's that in a different way. Here's one. That old priesthood didn't have an oath attached to it. This one does, which indicates that it has a better covenant. Let me read the passage. Chapter 7, verse 21 and 22 says, uh, He says, The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without an oath. But he, be he, Jesus, became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn, the Lord has sworn, and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. That's the kind of priesthood, so when, although God had selected who the priest would be, when he also selected Jesus to be the ch chief and true high priest, he says that I swear that this will be a priesthood that will never, ever, ever end. That's a difference in the priesthood. Priesthoods. Another difference is this. The former priesthood's ministry uh, was generational, but Jesus' is permanent. So it says this in verse 23 and 25 of chapter 7. It says, Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from the continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Aaron had sons. Aaron died, the sons took his place. Aaron's sons died, their sons took their place, and on and on and on and on. Jesus, there's one Jesus. There's no son of Jesus or that's going to replace his priesthood. He's one priest, and it's not passed down. He's the one. That's a difference in the priesthoods. Another difference, and we're, we're, look, we're in chapter 7. It's only been five minutes. We're almost at 10, so I'm, see, I'm being brief. <laughs> the former priesthoods also, uh, the former priests were morally weak men. Jesus, on the other hand, is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. I just took all those straight from the passage, chapter 7, verse 26. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day. How awkward is that? You're going in on behalf of all these sinful people that you're representing. And before you get to that, you got to sacrifice for your own sins. <laughs> I can relate in a small way. I come up here and preach to a crowd after I have to preach to myself first. I pummel myself into the ground and then try to pick myself up and, 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 uh, and preach to everyone else. But Jesus was not, in, was, was not that way. He was a perfect and blameless priest. And here's another difference. 
And this is going to lead right into where we're at in chapter 9. That old priesthood offered gifts and sacrifices in their Old Testament ministry, and Jesus offers better sacrifices as part of the New Testament ministry. Chapter 9 explains the Old Testament ministry's effect in order to show the surpassing effectiveness of Jesus' New Testament ministry. Let me read a passage to just try to work that out. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially, ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. There was a kind of purification that happened externally by these sacrifices that were made in the tabernacle. So you could kill a bull or a goat or a heifer or birds or whatever it was, and there was that had some effect. But then the comparison. How much more then will the blood of Christ, so there's the, the, the contrast, uh, goats, bulls, heifers, blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. One is just the blood of animals that may give some sort of external cleansing. The other is the blood of Christ, which actually purges our consciences so that we can truly serve the living God out of pure faith. Um, I could truly just say amen, and I think that there's enough meat there to chew on for the day, but you wouldn't get your money's worth. <laughs> so in chapter 10, after all that being said about the priesthood already, we're going to see... Um, we are going to see that the Old Testament ways, including the priesthood and the sacrifices that had happened, were just a shadow, that they were pointing to something that was greater. And so this is going to be another contrast, a difference between the old priesthood and the new priesthood, and then end with an exhortation. After knowing all of this, everything I've just rushed through, but Aragon has worked his way through slowly, and, and including what I'm about to preach in the next four verses, leads to an exhortation of, how this ought to bind your conscience and compel you. So let's stand together. We're going to read the whole chapter and then we'll jump in. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. This is God's word. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Verse 8. First, first, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the, the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. 
And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that will sanctify them, that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Verse 33. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Bless the reading of your word, please, we ask God. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So, I have to admit that I'm not going to nearly do this whole passage justice because I want to cover the whole chapter, but I, I, uh, I do want to, I guess, hit the high points, you could say. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of talk about the priesthood of the Old Testament in Hebrews and the comparison to be con- con- comparisons <laughs> and the contrast between Christ's priesthood and the Old Covenant priesthood. And uh, so as I was thinking of this, I, I wondered what would the what what would the you know a day in the life of an uh, Old Testament priest look like? And so uh, let's just run through real quick. And you may have seen this this uh, picture before. I don't know if you can see that really well. It's pretty clear. Where's my pointer at? There it is. So here you have the um, kind of the whole tabernacle, right? And then this is, or I guess this is like the wall behind around the tabernacle. And then this is the inside of the tabernacle. A day in the life of a priest. First of all, the priest would wake up, probably in somewhere, one of these tents right around here on the outside somewhere. You know, the Gershonites over here, Kohathites, whatever. The Levites were encamped right around the, uh, the tabernacle itself. Wake up and put their priestly garments on. Um, there was a specific garb that they had to wear. Um, they would enter into their workplace, basically, their tabernacle. Wash their hands and feet in a bronze laver. See this right here? It's a big bowl of water, basically. Uh, they would come in and tend the lampstand. There's a lampstand right here. Seven uh, lamps on it or candles on it. Trim the wicks, fill the cups with the oil, keep it going. It was to always be burning constantly, all the time. And actually, before they would even do that, they would probably come here to where they would offer burnt offerings. You've heard of, if you read the Old Testament at all, you're familiar with burnt offerings. Burnt offerings were to just burn overnight. So the priests, when they walked in, after they had been sleeping out near the, you know, where they had been working at, they would be smelling these smells and seeing the smoke all the time. This is just what their life was like all day, every day. Come in, wipe the, uh, grab, you know, sweep the ashes up from the burnt offering from the night before, and then somebody was designated to take that outside the camp. They would come in, trim the wicks on the lamp, like I said, they would come up here to this uh, uh, altar of incense, and they would have these spices and everything that mixed together and start burning incense, because that was to be always constantly Burning also, which, just side note, in the book of Revelation, that symbolizes the prayers of the saints constantly um, rising to the Lord. 
Um, as I said, they retrieved the ashes from the altar and then stoked the fire to keep the fire at the altar. This altar here, this is the altar of burnt incense, uh, of, uh, of burnt sacrifices. This is the altar of incense, two different altars. So they would come here and keep this fire going, stoke up the fire. And then they would offer a lamb. There was, they would kill a lamb. Just imagine what that would be like right here on that, on that uh, altar. And that's how they kicked off their day, every single day. From there, throughout the day, they would receive various offerings from, diff from Israelites, whether there were other burnt offerings, peace offerings, wave offerings. Um, five, there was five different offerings, uh, sin offerings, guilt offerings, of bulls, goats, sheep, lamb, uh, birds, various different animals. And there were different ways that like a bird, you're supposed to wring its neck, but not you know, not decapitate it because you basically want to keep the shape of the bird while you're sacrificing it. All these, this, this elaborate detailed way that they were supposed to be killing animals all day long, pouring out the blood. Actually, the burnt offering, when it came, it was up to the person who brought it to kill it. And then the, the priest was to hold a basin underneath to cut, catch the blood so they could sprinkle the blood mixed with water onto the horns of the altar. And it was a pretty gruesome feat. Um, this, is, this was the life of a, of a priest. And so they would receive these different offerings, various offerings throughout the day. Um, some of which they would eat portions of the meat because that was what was provided then through the law. And um, at the end of the day, he would return to the altar to kill another one-year-old lamb. They, they killed a one-year-old lamb in the morning, then they killed another one at night every single day. They trimmed the wicks again, stoked the altar fire with the burnt offering left upon it until the next day where he would wake up and do it all over again. That was what a day in the life of the priest would look like. I mean, maybe there's there were some days where, of course, they were on the move, and so they would be responsible for breaking everything down and then uh, hauling it with the caravan or whatever. But by and large, this is what their day consisted of. In uh, Hebrews chapter 10, what we just read, it says that the law, including the law that instituted them making all these sacrifices constantly, was only a shadow of good things that are coming and uh, not realities themselves. The, the, the main point of the first few verses of this chapter is that all of these sacrifices do not take away sins. Uh, I can't, I feel like I didn't do a very good job of putting into your mind the, in a graphic way, what, just what that would be like, the bloody mess that the tabernacle would be um, perpetually. And the people that would come there doing this out of some sort of reverence and fear for the Lord, at least most of the time. Um, but with, with all of that happening, the writer of Hebrews makes clear that this does not actually take away sin. So we get that from a few different words in the passage here. First of all, we get that from the fact that he says it's a shadow, just a shadow. A uh, shadow means a form without substance. It's like an outline or a silhouette. It portrays something that is real, but it's not actually real itself. I mean, you can imagine that. Shadow is, is the right word to use because a shadow gives you like an outline or a silhouette, but you can't actually see any details or what the true meaning is. And that's, that's all that these sacrifices were. Um, secondly, the way that we know that it doesn't take away sins is in verse 1, 4, and 11. It uses these words. Look at it with me. The law is only a shadow, the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. So then it goes on and says, for this reason it can never, can never, by the same sacrifices repeated, make perfect those who draw near to worship. In verse 4, it says, it is impossible, that's a pretty strong word, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And one more time in verse 11, it says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs the religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. In case it's unclear, 
These sacrifices do not, cannot, will not, would not take away sin. Another way that we know that, that these sacrifices don't take away sins, verses 2 and 3. In verse 2 it says that these sacrifices are unceasing, they're unending. They're, it says, otherwise would they not have stopped being offered? If, if, if sin was taken away and done with, dealt with, finally, ultimately, totally, then there would be no more sacrifices. It would be done. It would be done. Um... But it says, on the contrary, that they happen repeatedly, over and over and over, nonstop. Therefore, far from it being a setting aside of sin or a doing away with sin, it was actually a reminder of sin. I read in a uh, you know good little illustration that really that really captures this, and it's if when somebody is sick and they take medication, is the medication a reminder that they are better? It's a reminder that they're sick. If somebody's cured of a sickness, you throw the pills away. The, 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 the sacrifice would be a constant reminder of more sin and more sin and more sin and more sin and more sin. And more sin. So we find out that these sacrifices uh, indeed do not take away sin. Another one is verse 1. Uh, perfect those who draw near. What was my point there? Oh, it says it cannot perfect those who, who, who draw near. So that's clear. And in chapter 7, verse 18 and 19, let me just uh, kind of cross-reference this. It says that the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. Okay, in verse 1 of chapter 10, it says that it cannot make perfect those who draw near to worship. The question I want you to ask is, well, what, what does it mean to be perfect? It doesn't make perfect those who draw near. The drawing near would be those who would maybe bring an offering to the tabernacle, but it wouldn't make those people perfect. Perfect, in this case, is not just simply sinless. Perfect, instead, means having total uh, access to God, true access to God. And so that's why I went to chapter 7, verse 18. Listen, listen to what it says here, or maybe follow along. It's in chapter 7, verse 18. It says, The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, parentheses, for the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. The former regulation is contrasted with the better hope, and the being made perfect is contrasted with the drawing near to God. It's the interpersonal, it's the relationship that is reconciled and restored uh, between the believer and his God. That's, that's the perfection that's being uh, talked about here. And uh, one, more, one more kind of verse I want to point to about how we know this is not does not take away sins. And it is in verse 5. It says, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. Now this is a quote from Psalm chapter 40 and being used here about the Messiah. Sacrifices and offerings you have not... Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Um... With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Something that I just want to make very, very, very clear is that in the Old Testament, there was never a time when people could simply offer a sacrifice and let the sacrifice be sufficient. There's too many instances in the Old Testament where God says things like he was quoted here in Psalm 40. These were not what was ultimately pleasing or desirable to the Lord. You say, but yeah, God set up the system. Now, yeah, he did set up the system, and he had a reason for that, and it was set up in a way that he wanted to be set up. But multiple times throughout the Old Testament, uh, you see people referencing the, old, the, the sacrifices and saying, this is not going to be enough. Psalm 51 comes to mind, where 
where David is grieving over his sin, and he mentions that you don't delight in sacrifices, or else I would give it. But it's a broken and a contrary heart that's a sacrifice of God. The most famous uh, passage, actually, let me read a few more. In Hosea 6.6, 6, it says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Psalm 51, 16 and 17, this is the one I just mentioned. For you will not delight in sacrifice where I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. What about this one? Isaiah chapter 1, 11 and 12 says, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of, go of, of goats. And then the most famous, which I have up there on the screen, is 1 Samuel 15. You probably remember this, where Saul had given sacrifices because that's what God wants, right? God just wants a pleasing aroma to him, which is what is said about the sacrifices multiple times. So I'll just burn a really, 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 really big blameless bull, uh, bull or goat. <laughs> uh, that's not the way that this works. Samuel tells Saul, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Listen, the sacrificial system, the, the offering of these different animals, was a token or a symbol or an act of a person's fear and trust of God. It's not the act itself separated from the heart that had anything that had you know, anything that to, to, to really offer to God. God doesn't need the blood or the smell of or the smoke of a burnt offering. In this passage, you get a kind of a transition into what the Messiah had come to do. He came to do God's will. Verse 5, the other part of that passage is sacrifice and offering you did not desire. But a body you prepared for me. But a body you prepared for me. There's, the, there's, there's what really matters. It says, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. So, in looking into this, in Psalm 40. Okay, let's just I'm try to make this as simple as possible. Was the Bible made, written in English, originally? No. no. Everybody's tracking with me wasn't written in English. If you, didn't, if you didn't know that, you know that now. This is not written in English originally. It was written in various different languages, but like the New Testament, it was written primarily in Greek, okay? Who knows, who here knows that when you translate from one language to another language, there are some words that don't have an exact equivalent. So there could be a little bit of a discrepancy. The same thing I just explained there, if you're tracking with me on, Apply that to the Old Testament. The Old Testament was not originally written in Greek. Are you tracking with me? It was originally written mostly in Hebrew. There were translations from the Hebrew into other languages, the same way there's translations from the Bible in its original language into Spanish, English, so on and so forth. There are some discrepancies between the original language in the Old Testament and the language they were translated into. One of those discrepancies is, in this passage, in Psalm 40, the original language, the most literal rendering is, uh, sacrifices and offerings you did not, offerings you did not desire, but a, but a body, sorry, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but you have dug out the ears. And in the translation of that, it formed into a body you have prepared for me. The reason why I point that out is just to kind of it's kind of sort of trivial, but it, it blends to the point that the, that the idea here is that full obedience, a, a God forming in a person the complete will to do all that he has said, because it's not just sacrifice that he desires, it's full obedience out of trust and love for him. And so... This man who, who this passage applies to is the one who hears, understands, embraces fully, and obeys completely. That's the first uh, meaning of this passage. 
But it says that I have come to do your will. So then what is his will? Is it just to obey, like honor your parents and don't murder or don't even get too angry with somebody or any number of other commandments? It's even more than that. Jesus had only done what he heard and saw his father do. That's what he said. Which included obeying all the commandments of the Old Testament. And it also, uh, it also means healing the one man at the pool of Bethesda instead of the whole crowd that was there. He was specifically following everything that God wanted him to do. But included in that is his own death. So in Matthew 26, 39... A famous scene where Jesus comes to the end of his life after obeying God fully through his whole entire life, even getting baptized just for the sake of fulfilling all righteousness. When he comes to the end of his life and he's praying in the garden, what does he pray? What does he pray? My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Even in him laying his own life down, that was in obedience to his father. Verse 9 says, as we're talking about this man, Jesus, doing the will of God. In Jesus coming and obeying God fully, and then even to the laying down of his life under the Father's will, he does away with the, these other sacrifices, this, this kind of sacrificial system where you would just try to think, you know, think transactionally that you could just pay God off with the bull. That's done away with. And there is something new that's established. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, by that will, what's the will? I just said, the will that Jesus did, which is the Father's will, which is obedience to him, as even to the point of death. That will, by that will, by the obedience of that man, and by the death of that man, by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus comes and says, I have come to do your will, my God, you have prepared a body for me, and through that body, through his complete sacrifice and his death, we've been made holy and compare that to the endless sacrifices I detailed out earlier. This one man comes and does in a moment what couldn't be done in an eternity of perpetual sacrifices. In John chapter 6, verse 29, Jesus had answered the crowd when they asked him, What is the work of God that you would have us do? The work of God is this, to believe in the one who he has sent. To believe in the one who he has sent. What could have been the work of God? Maybe going to the tabernacle every single day with a new bull. Maybe offering something. That's No, the work of God is to believe in the one who actually puts away sin. Now, let me just remind you. The greatest dilemma that every individual person has ever had is sin. This is the issue. So when you consider other religions or other non-religions, if they don't want to be called a religion, or whatever, other worldviews, other philosophies, a, a, a fundamental, inevitable question that has to be asked is, what do you do about sin? What did Buddha do about sin? How are atheists going to be forgiven of sin or put away sin? Not minimize it. Not get your not get free from addiction and not not you know make progress, not just enjoy the journey and, and get better at life and do not just no, I'm talking about I'm talking about kick it out, die to it, let it in every superlative you can think of to say that sin does not exist anymore. It's gone. It's gone and has no effect. No the guilt of it, the punishment that needs to be that needs to be enacted because of it, that's all gone. What does an atheist do to cause that? What is, what is a Muslim? What's their, what, how are you going to deal with sin? The answer in Christianity, and the only answer for all of humanity, is the man Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus. 
offer 50 bowls a day, every single day until you die, and then pass that ministry on to your son and offer another 50 every single day until you die, and pass it on again, and it's dead. you're going nowhere. You're spinning your wheels every sacrifice you make until the one man, Christ Jesus, comes and dies. Now it's done. Now it's done. That's the point that he's getting at. So we see the completion of that act in another way, in verse 12. He sat down at the right hand of God. The work's done. The work's all done. Now he just sits down and he waits. Verse 17 and 18 um, says it better than I could say it. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. That is music to our ears. That is the balm that all of humanity has been yearning for, whether they want to acknowledge it or not, for all of their existence. That God would remember their sins no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Now, I went on a little tangent there for a second because the fact is none of us are tempted to go to the entrance of any building around here with our, you know, with our heifer <laughs> and, uh, and ask somebody to kill it. You know, we're not going to take it to the butcher and think that that has anything to do with forgiveness of sins. But there are a myriad of other ways that people think that they can placate God for their sin. And every single one of them are as bankrupt or even more stupid than even the sacrificial system. Because at least the sacrificial system was given by God. Everything else is not even given by God. It's you saying, hey God, I'm going to offer you something that you have to forgive me for now. As if, as if you, know, you offended me and then you tell me when I'm going to forgive you. Is that the way that that works? That's not the way that that works. God gives forgiveness and he does it by paying for sin through Jesus Christ. So, what's the exhortation after all of this? What's the exhortation? The exhortation is to draw near to God. Probably turned it off. No, nope, it's on. Oh, well, can you hit the space bar? It's okay. You know, all right, just time out. I... I don't like having all the information up there, so I've been distracted this whole time. I wish we could have just done it point by point. Anyway, so if you don't advance the slide, that's okay, because I like to keep you guessing. So, <laughs> verse 22. Uh, verse 22 gives us the exhortation. Look at it with me. Uh, sorry, starting in verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, you know, that one place that only one priest could go one time a year, that place. We have confidence to enter that holy place. By a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. Remember the body that he said you prepared for me? And he's okay, we're there. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, here is the command. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Not a constant reminder of sin, but a constant reminder of forgiveness. I mentioned earlier about the, you know, kind of the perpetual hypocrite you have to be to be a preacher, you know, that you read the passage, you're convicted, you repent, you pray, and then you have to come up and preach. So I'm feeling that with what I'm about to say. Why do we have believers walking around dejected and defeated all the time with a passage like this? It says to draw near in a certain way. We have our hearts, our consciences uh, cleansed, truly cleansed. Draw near to him with full assurance that faith brings. I, I will just say no in certain terms. There is such a thing as a confident Christian. And for all the warnings and worries about false Christians and making false claims and all of that, which are legitimate and are biblical, even in this very book, 
With all that being said, there is such a thing as having confidence in the Lord. We don't walk around paranoid that the one who gave his son for us might just change his mind. Now, we don't rest our confidence in ourselves and say, well, I'm doing the Christian thing pretty well, so I get... that's not where it's at, because then you ought to be worried. But if you're going to look at the son of the, of the living God who's taken on sin and paid for it and then wonder or question, that's not humility anymore. That's not humility anymore. That ought to bring comfort and confidence. So let me just, uh, we're going we're gonna to take a little excursion, if that's the right word. If you'll turn with me, please, to uh, somewhere. Where are we going? Well, I'll just remember. Uh, Numbers chapter 10. One through four. Oh, did I have it up there? Yeah. Oh, you switched the, switched the slide. Well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. All right, you know where I'm going. Numbers chapter 10, one through four. Now, we're, we're going to walk through a story that you're probably familiar with, but I'm going to point out a couple of details that you may or may not be familiar with. And I'm going to use that just to kind of show the type of fear we ought to have if you would like to kind of doubt all this, uh, all this that Jesus has done for us. So numbers. Wait a minute. I don't know who wrote my notes, but it's Leviticus chapter 10. I'm sorry. I know. I know. Your thumbs are going to hurt. You know, people got to wake up now. Jeez, oh, Leviticus chapter 10. It says this. Now, Aaron was the high priest, okay? So that makes his sons also priests. Priests, okay. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. This is them doing their priestly duties, sounds like. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. It's not just about what you offer, it's about obedience to the Lord. Out of love and fear. So what happens because they do this? God accepted the offering because something's better than nothing, no. Verse 2, so fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Instant death. Now, we know that they weren't consumed in a way that just left ash, because it says later in verse uh, 4, Moses summoned Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, come here, carry your cousins outside the camp, away from the front of the sanctuary. So they have been carried out. Their bodies drop dead and they're carried out. Because they offer the wrong thing. God didn't say to offer this. Now that's the story that's pretty familiar. You've probably heard that story before. But I mentioned that I might point out a couple details you may not be so familiar with. Some people would say that maybe what had happened here is that they offered, one of the reasons they had offered the, this, this, this offering was because they were drunk. The reason why they say that is because if you look further just a little bit more in verse 8, you have the only time in Leviticus where God talks directly to Aaron, not to Moses, but directly to Aaron. And what's his warning to him? Then the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons are not to drink wine or other fermented drink, Whenever you go into the tent of meeting or you will die. That sounds a lot like maybe this is a reference to what just happened to his sons. Okay, that's reasonable. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come so that you can distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean, and so you can teach the Israelites all the decrees the Lord has given them through Moses. Um, 
We'll look at one more passage to, to get a little bit more detail into what really happened here. So I'm thinking it's reasonable to say that they offer this unauthorized offering, um, maybe even under the influence. But here's another detail, and this is what I really want to what I want to point out. Go to chapter 16. This is where Leviticus 16. This is where God, to Moses, gives him the uh, the how to or the institution of the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement is pretty, you know, um, famous because that's the one day a year that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. Okay. But listen to the intro. The Lord spoke to Moses when, after the death of the two sons of Aaron, who died when they approached the Lord. When they approached the Lord where? The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place, behind the curtain, in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die. For I will appear... And the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must, and then it goes on and gives the details of how he is to offer the, the, the offering, the sacrifice. What I'm getting at is, I think it's pretty unavoidable that Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons, have walked not only maybe under the influence an unauthorized offering, but they did that into the holy place. So it's even out of that that God says, listen, there will be one time every year that one man can come into that place, but when he does, let me remind you not to do it anything like his sons did. That's the kind of lack of access that they had in the Old Testament. I reference all that just to say in Hebrews chapter 10, what's our command? After everything Jesus has done, after him being the once for all sacrifice, let us draw near to God. People in the Old Testament, Nadab and Abihu, died trying to draw near to the Lord in an unauthorized way. We in the New Testament are commanded, that's been taken care of. We have a true priest that's entered into the true holy place. Now you draw near or else. There were threats uh, for those who were trying to draw near too hastily. Now there are threats for those who won't come. Let's just read it because I'm, uh, I'm just going to kind of wind down. In verse 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning, now this is not any kind of sin. If we just continue to lie to our kids after we become a Christian, or if we just, no, this is talking about if you reject the good news that's been preached to you. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. There's finally been a sacrifice that's finally sufficient that opens up the holy place so that we can have true access to God. If you reject that, you are damned. Jesus said that. He said, this is the judgment. The light has come, but men like their darkness rather than light. The, the welcome, the offer, the invite is here. If you say no, there's nothing else. There's nothing else. I lied. There is something else. <laughs> a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Like Nadab and Abihu. This is like a reversal. They approached too fast. They got killed. You don't approach when he offers, you will be killed. Eternally. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? That's what happens when you reject this offer of the gospel. Trampling the Son of God underfoot. Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant. 
Jesus said when he gave the cup at the Last Supper, this is the blood in my covenant. You want to not participate? He treated as an unholy thing and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a very terrible, dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, therefore, I'm trying, man, I'm really trying to wrap up. I think I got up here late, though, so, in my defense. <laughs> no, honestly, either that or I didn't look at the clock until it was 15 minutes past what I thought. Um, uh, I would like to advance the slide this time. I'm going to do it, do it the whole time. <laughs> uh, let me just summarize. Uh, so all I'm trying to get at is that there is one no act that man can do in order to earn forgiveness of sin. We know that. I'm reminding you of that. If you don't know that, you need to know that. If you don't know that, you cannot be a Christian. You know why? Because you will not seek a Savior if you think there's something else to save you. You have to know that when the rich young ruler came to Jesus looking for salvation, what does it take to be saved? By the time he's done with him and that guy walks off and he's sorrowful, his disciples who witnessed the whole thing asked him, Lord, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, with man, it is impossible. It is impossible. Anything, any, you just anything, it's impossible to be saved apart from his, his work. So there's no, there's no act that man can do in order to earn forgiveness of sin. Number two, one man has truly and fully done the will of God, making it possible. Not making it only possible, but making it sure. Making it sure for any of those who would, who would hold on to that hope in him. We can be assured of salvation and inheriting the eternal promise. Therefore, embrace him fully in every way for all time. Let me just read this passage, just, just a quick comment. He says, to, he says to draw near to God, but then he goes on and he says, let us, so draw near to God and then continue to hold unswervingly to that hope. And then let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Part of embracing him is embracing his people. They are inseparable. It's a package deal. Something I was going to say about that. I don't have it written down. I'll just point out that in at the end of this passage, when this author is reminding this specific audience of what they ought to be doing, the things he reminds them of largely have to do with the way they interacted with the people of God. Remember those early days after you have received the light, when you endured a, in a great conflict uh, full of suffering. So they personally suffered. But it says, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. There were even brothers that were being treated badly and they stood alongside them in support. You also suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. This was all done, you know, they... There were other people, other believers that they're participating with in these different sufferings. And Paul, or not Paul, Apollos, whoever it was, <laughs> uh, says uh, to remember those days. That's what happens. Do you remember what Peter did when Peter was just coming into a full knowledge of this gospel? And, and, and so he's starting to embrace the Gentiles because that was scandalous, but it's true in the gospel. I mean, God is the God of everyone and anybody can come to him apart from trying to become a Jew first. Paul had just kind of got turned on to that. And so he was associating with the Gentiles that were believers, the God-fearers, the, the Christians. But all of a sudden, when Paul shows up or when some other Jewish people show up, what does he do? I'm going uh, to step back over here. I'm not, you know, and disassociate himself from true people of God in order to try to appease these other more devout Jewish people. That was the capitulation by disassociating from believers in order to look a little bit more Jewish or a little more in line with Judaism. That was the capitulation and Paul called them on it. Why do you act this way and eat, eat, eat the bacon and the pork and the ham and, and everything 
with the Gentiles, like you know you're free to do in Christ, that would be walking in freedom. That would be walking with the security and assurance you have in the gospel. Why do you do that when these Jewish opponents or you know people who want to conf conflict with what you're doing, you do that you know when they're not around, but then when they come around, you try to you try to disassociate. No, we associate with the people of God. That's that's so. Uh, one of the primary ways and an inseparable way that we hold on to our hope and draw near to God. So with all of that being said, I'm just going to close in prayer and uh, we'll sing one more song before we go home. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you most of all, though, Lord, for this sacrifice that Jesus made and the sufficiency of it. There's nothing to add. There's nothing we could add. There was not even anything in the past that was a replacement or substitute. He is the once for all sacrifice. And I pray, God, for each believer that's in here, that our, our confidence, our assurance would be in him, that we would not be those who shrink back, but would, first of all, have confidence before you as we, as we pray, as we seek to know you and love you and serve you. But secondly, that as we go into the world, we would walk with that same boldness and confidence, Lord, knowing that we have a Father in heaven who has given everything for us and will give everything to us. Help us to walk with that confidence every day. Why are our souls downcast? Let us be full of joy, Lord. Let us walk by faith and not by sight and have the assurance of things that are hoped for. And for those that are here that don't know you, Lord, I just ask that you would not let them go, not let them leave this place without the weight of full conviction and the warning and the threat of rejecting your gracious offer. I pray that every unbeliever would be converted and that every believer would be strengthened and that in all these things, you'll be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.